Hello, dear friends, and welcome back to day three of our 14th Synod of the Anglican Network in Canada. Uh, this is uh, to be our final of three days, back to back to back, uh, but we're by no means done. We have uh, seen the Lord help us. Uh, some very significant things have happened, and we're rejoicing in that. Um, I, uh, my wife and I, as is our pattern, uh, had morning prayer this morning, and uh, what we have been doing for the last several months is we have a list of prayers, which included praying that God would lead us as a diocese to a faithful pastor who would be our next bishop. Uh, and officially, as of this morning, I deleted that prayer uh, and uh, just uh, said, thank you, and prayer answered. And in God's goodness, uh, we all were able to watch the Lord work as he pointed to uh, now Bishop, coadjutor bishop-elect Dan Gifford. And uh, what, a, what a moving thing when Ken and Mike Stewart uh, made his statement before ballot three. So we really have a sense of, of a firm foundation of God at work in our midst. But now we have a lot of work to do today on day three. Uh, and so we look forward to that. But rightly, we're going to begin with worship. And I'm grateful that Deacon Ben Vanderhyde of St. Peter and St. Paul's and Elise Bigley, also of St. Peter and St. Paul's, will be leading us. Uh, just was reminiscing with them that, in fact, the last time we had an in-person uh, synod uh, was at St. Peter and St. Paul's in 2019. We never thought that was going to be the case. Twice we've tried to be at St. Matthew's Abbotsford, uh, but, but here we are online. And I uh, um, also want to say that thinking of St. Peter and St. Paul's, we rejoice today on the November, November 19th, three months ago on August 19th, Ken and Brant Stiller had his kidney transplant and he's now restored to health and officially is back. And so many of us have been praying over this period of time and we rejoice. So uh, Deacon Ben and Elise, welcome. Please lead us in worship. Thank you, Bishop Charlie. Good morning, everyone. Or should I say good afternoon for those this side of the East. Let's begin. Oh God, make speed to save us. Oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia. Friends, let's sing. Sweet 
Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. With his own right hand and with his holy arm, he has won for himself the victory. The Lord declared his salvation. His righteousness has he openly shown in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and truth toward the house of Israel, and all the ends of the world have seen the salvation of our God. Show yourselves joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Sing, rejoice voice and give thanks praise the lord with the harp sing with the harp a psalm of thanksgiving with trumpets also and horns oh show yourself joyful before the lord the king let the sea make a noise and all that is in it the round world and those who dwell therein let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills be joyful together before the lord for he has come to judge the earth with righteousness shall he judge the world and the peoples with equity. Glory, Glory be, be to the, the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the letter, letter to the Hebrews. Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who, for a little while, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children, I and the children God has given me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-living Father, we have given the, you have given the Holy Spirit to abide with us forever. Bless, we pray, with the Holy Spirit's grace and presence, the bishops, priests, deacons, and all the laity who assemble in your name in diocesan synod, that your church, being preserved, in true faith and godly discipline may fulfill the will of him who loved her and gave himself for her 
your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who now lives and reigns with you, and the same Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual, effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your son Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, by your word, you laid the foundations of the earth, set the bounds of the sea and still the wind and waves. Surround us with your grace and peace and preserve us through this flooding. By your spirit, lift up those who have evacuated their homes those who are in danger, and those who have lost their livelihoods. Strengthen those who work to rescue or rebuild, and fill us with the hope of your new creation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Savior, you desire that none should perish, and you have taught us through your Son that there is great joy in heaven over every sinner who repents, Grant that our hearts may ache for a lost and broken world. May your Holy Spirit work through our words, deeds, and prayers that the lost may be found and the dead made alive, and that all your redeemed may rejoice around your throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God, you made us in your own image. And you have redeemed us through your son, Jesus Christ. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you, and then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. But I am not forsaken, for by my 
Thank you, Deacon Ben and Elise, and thank you for uh, the two singing groups from New Song most recently, but also uh, Good Shepherd Richmond. I loved it that we uh, were able to sing along, remembering the Asian and multicultural ministries in Canada ministry, and and uh, and then isn't it great that uh, you know as Christians we we read the Word, we sing the Word, we pray the Word. And then we have the word expounded, and that's what's going to happen just now. I'm going to call on the Reverend Keith Ganser to continue his teaching, which he started on Wednesday. Uh, it would have been nice if we had another day where he could have done a three-part, uh, but we're so grateful for uh, what we're going to receive now from Hebrews 2. And I'm just going to pray and then hand it over to, to the Reverend Keith Ganser. Oh, God, we thank you uh, for our theme verse uh, verses for uh, which come from the epistle of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so, Lord, we are grateful for this great letter, and we thank you for any opportunity to reflect on it and for you to lift up the Lord Jesus before us. And so we trust our friend and uh, the rector, uh, rector of Christ the King 
the Reverend Keith Ganser and pray that you would anoint him by your Holy Spirit to deliver your word in your way and give us hearts ready to receive and to respond. For we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Reverend Keith, please. Thank you, Bishop Charlie. Dear friends, I'm glad to be with you again today as we return to the early chapters of the book of Hebrews. On Wednesday, if you recall, we began with a short reflection on the benediction from Hebrews 13 that Bishop Charlie selected as the theme for this synod. And we focused on the core of the pastor's prayer there in verse 21 that God would equip you, equip us with everything good that we may do his will. And then we saw why it's so important that we do his will. How according to Hebrews 10 verse 36, it's so that we may receive what is promised. For you have need of endurance, the pastor writes in that verse. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. That's why in his concluding prayer, the pastor wants God to supply his hearers with the good things brought about by the high priestly ministry of Christ that will enable them to live lives of enduring faith all the way to the end. You and I, like the recipients of Hebrews, will receive what is promised only because the Son makes it possible which is why my summary of Hebrews from last time was that it's all about the Son bringing about the promise. <clears throat> on Wednesday, we focused on the first part of that summary by asking who is the Son. Today, as we turn to Hebrews chapter 2, our attention is on the last part of that summary as we ask, what is the promise? Now, you may have noticed that the word promise does not appear in Hebrews chapters 1 and 2. Instead, at the start of his written sermon, the pastor uses the language of salvation. At the end of chapter 1, the pastor says in verse 14, are they, referring here to angels in the context of chapter 1, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? And in verse 3 of chapter 2, the pastor poses this haunting question. How shall we escape, he asks rhetorically, if we neglect such a great salvation? So... What's he talking about? What is salvation? First, let's make a distinction here. Sometimes when you and I talk about salvation, what we mean is how we're saved. So we say things like salvation meets us at the cross or we've been saved by the blood of Jesus. And that's good. The Bible often, especially in the New Testament, the Bible uses the language in that way. Salvation can include the means by which we're saved, which indeed centers on the incarnation and death of Jesus Christ on the cross for sins, his resurrection, that would all seem to be included in verse 3 of our passage in Hebrews 2, where the pastor warns us about neglecting such a great salvation. It's part of what God has spoken by his son. But at other times in the Bible, the focus isn't so much on how we are saved as it is on what we're being saved to. And it is that goal that I think Hebrews has primarily in focus from the beginning. And the way I'll put it is this for your consideration. Salvation is ultimately a place. Salvation is a place. And the simplest way to explain what I mean by that is that it's the place where God dwells. 
It's the place of the holy God of Israel. That place is where Hebrews is taking us, leading us, brothers and sisters, because arrival at that place has always been the hope of the people of God from the very beginning. It's what Abraham himself was looking for. Did you realize that? Why did Abraham have faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11? If you want to turn there, you can. In Hebrews 11, verse 9, it says, Abraham went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. What was the promise? Ready? Verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Do you see that? This is Abraham. And then from Abraham, chapter 11, verse 12 says, from one man, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised. What was the promise? Having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Verse 14, they were seeking a homeland, it says. Only that doesn't mean they were trying to go back home somehow. No, verse 16 they desire a better country, the pastor writes. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? What did they get right about God that he wasn't ashamed? For he has prepared for them a city. They were right to be looking ahead way beyond themselves to that city. Salvation is a place, brothers and sisters. It's where Abraham was heading, and according to Hebrews, it's where we hope to come in the end to, to what Hebrews 12 verse 22 calls Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The hope of God's people all through history has been that they will one day dwell with God. That's the core of salvation. You see, it's life with God. Better, it's life with God in a place. It's what was lost when sin entered the world. What lies before us as Christians, assuming we continue in faith, is the joy-filled celebration of arrival at the city of God, delighting in the knowledge that God's face is finally fully shining on us. Or you could say it's life as it was meant to be, and it's life as it will be forever in the new heavens and the new earth. This is the biblical hope. All creation renewed in the presence of God as God's people, Abraham's seed, live in covenant relationship with him and with our neighbors in that kingdom that cannot be shaken, as chapter 12 of Hebrews verse 28 puts it. All of which means that there's a goal in view, a goal as we live our lives, brothers and sisters. And in Hebrews, the pastor is summoning us to move towards it. As one scholar puts it, Hebrews portrays salvation as primarily a future destination for the people of God who are on pilgrimage towards it. Hebrews only makes sense when we recognize that you and I, like Abraham and like Isaac and like all those who died in faith, what's faith? The assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews only makes sense when we recognize that we're to live our lives with that destination in mind. The Christian life is a pilgrimage to the heavenly homeland, and faith is the mode of living on the way that pleases God. 
because there is no salvation apart from faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says. So what's been promised, what's been promised to all God's people through history is salvation. Salvation is what the Son is bringing about. Salvation is the promise. Salvation is a place. And in the language of verse 5 of our text now, in Hebrews chapter 2, that place is called the world to come. We're there now in Hebrews 2 verse 5. Look at it, please, in your Bible, or if you have to, on your phone. Verses 5 to 9 of Hebrews chapter 2 are where I want us to spend the rest of our time together today. The pastor writes in verse 5, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. Again, what world is he talking about? Well, it's the one to come. It's the place of salvation and the life we'll live in that place. It's the heavenly realm where Jesus is now already seated. And it's where we also will go and live with him because in the end, this heavenly realm, this world to come will be coterminous with all the universe. The world to come will encompass everything. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13. But Peter writes, according to his promise, there it is again, it's the promise. According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's the world to come in Hebrews. And you see the flow of thought we're in here. The main point in the first paragraph of Hebrews chapter 2 is verse 1, if you'd look there. The pastor begins verse 1, chapter 2, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. All that God has spoken by his son that has as its goal the attainment of the promise of salvation to that we must pay the greatest attention. Why? Because, jumping now to verse 5, which starts with the word for, verse 5, because, because it wasn't to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. Well, of course it wasn't. We'd already know from reading chapter 1, verse 14, that angels serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. So that now, now the question to be addressed here is, then to whom will the universe be subjected in the future. The pastor just assumes you see the point already, but the answer tells us something about how great our salvation really is. We grasp this point, the pastor's saying, and we'd be fools to neglect such a great salvation, whatever our circumstances may be in the present. So who is it? According to the pastor, who will rule in that eternal kingdom? Who, to whom, is the world to come subjected? And I've taken a long time to wind up the answer, but here it is. Who will rule in that eternal kingdom? You will, Christian. And I will. And all redeemed men and women will. Human beings, that's to whom the world to come has been subjected. God's ultimate intention is to have his kingdom ruled by women and men. Is that news to you? Does that surprise you? Have you ever really contemplated what it is that we'll be up to 
in the world to come of which we're speaking. We're not really helped here by much of the popular level, level, excuse me, the popular level Christian thinking regarding what heaven is like, right? Life in the world to come bears a strong resemblance to life as God always intended it to be and how he made it in the beginning. So, we're just going to move forward with the pastor and try to follow his thought, because basically now the pastor quotes, after saying what he's just said in verse 5, the pastor quotes from a psalm in verses 6 to 8a. And then the pastor comments in response to that psalm in verses 8b to 9, which is as far as we'll get together. And we'll just go through it. The psalm the pastor quotes from, beginning here in verse 6 of Hebrews 2, is Psalm 8. He doesn't say that. <laughs> he says, in fact, it has been testified somewhere, which seems odd. I think it's because he wants to continue to focus attention that in the past God spoke to our fathers by the prophets and that now that that has now its culmination and fulfillment in the Son, the pastor knows where he's quoting from. It's Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 to 6, but the point is this is God speaking, so pay attention. Let's read the quote from Psalm 8 here that begins in verse 6. It has been testified somewhere. All this is in support of verse 5. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Only I think that to make any sense of what the pastor's point is here, and as he then continues on after this quote from Psalm 8 in verse 8 of chapter 2, we need to understand some things about Psalm 8 itself. So I encourage you and I would ask you to turn to Psalm 8 in the text, assuming you have one. And I'll give you a moment to do that. But I can't see you doing it. I'll just trust you're doing it. If you turn to Psalm 8, it will help you if you can look at the text. Once you're there in Psalm 8, notice how Psalm 8 begins and ends the same way. You see it? O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The focus is on the name. And what name is David referring to? Well, he says it right up front. It's the Lord, all capital letters. That means Yahweh the God of the covenant. In other words, this is the God who has revealed himself to Israel by that name. And that name evokes the covenant. In other words, this is the God who's made promises to Abraham and his offspring and who will be faithful to those promises. That's what the use of that name entails, which is important to know, right? Because without that, Without the covenant, without the promise to Abraham and his descendants, if none of that had been revealed, well, then what would man be in this vast universe? You could wipe out the entire species, and it would seem to have no greater effect on the cosmos than the loss of the insect you might have done away with this morning. Seems to me that's the point of verse 3 of Psalm 8. If you're there in Psalm 8, verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? That you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. 
Now, I read son of man there in verse 4 in Psalm 8 in the standard Old Testament way as a reference to any human being. That's simply confirmed by the parallelism that's here between these two lines of verse 4 in Psalm 8. Man in the first line is in parallel with the son of man in the second. The point is simply that we're all sons of men, right? Do you get the psalmist's point here? Maybe you do if you live somewhere other than Toronto where there simply are no stars to be seen in the sky at night. But even most city dwellers have had the experience of going to some place where you can really see the stars. And if you get yourself to a really dark place to stare up at the night sky, well, it's incredible. And of course, it's just what we can see with our naked eyes, which amounts uh, to something like about 2,500 stars in the field of vision that we can take in just with our, our own eyes, something like that. But of course, astronomers estimate that there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in our universe, most of which have hundreds of billions or in some cases, even trillions of stars in them. We can't even imagine that. My question is, the psalmist's question is, what's the natural conclusion to be drawn from that? Well, to put it mildly, the conclusion is that we're not very significant, right? What is man? But then the psalmist considers this. He considers this not from the viewpoint of physics or whatever form that was, was in the first, or when David would have written this, not from the viewpoint of physics or of humanism, but he considers it from the inexplicable, at least apart from grace, the inexplicable faithfulness of the Lord, our Lord, the creator God, who turns out to be the covenant God, Yahweh, who chose Abraham and made a promise to Abraham. And what was that promise? Well, this is a bit of a sidebar, but do you know how Paul describes it in Romans chapter 4, verse 13? In Romans 4, verse 13, don't leave Psalm 8. In Romans 4, verse 13, Paul describes it as the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be, catch this phrase, heir of the world. That's right there in Romans 4, verse 13 that Abraham and his offspring would be heir of the world. Well, what world do you think Paul's talking about there? How about the world to come? How about, same thing, the new heavens and new earth of Isaiah chapters 65 and 66, which includes, of course, the physical earth itself. You see, the glory of humanity isn't innate to the cosmos. A look at the night sky reveals that. According to the Bible, the glory of humanity is bestowed upon us by the covenant Lord. That's what verse 5 of Psalm 8 says. Yet you, Psalm 8 verse 5, yet you, Lord, our Lord, have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've done that. And so then, according to Psalm 8, what does that glory look like? And this is critical to see, which is why I want you in Psalm 8. Because if you look carefully, you realize that the author of Hebrews omits the first part of verse 6 of Psalm 8 in what he quotes. And there's debates about why. I don't think it's because the pastor writing Hebrews is trying to say something different than the psalm. Keep reading here in verse 6 of Psalm 8. What's the glory? You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Don't forget that line. 
all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Contemplating the vastness of the universe, what ultimately astonishes the psalmist, David, isn't the marvelous creation itself. It's the covenant God's intention for men and women within it. You see? David sees that men and women are to have dominion. That all things are to be under their feet. That they are to exercise stewardship over the world of all God's creatures and created things. But now where does David get such an outrageous idea as that? Where does his understanding of that intention of God come from? Well, where do we find this language of dominion elsewhere in the scriptures? You know where. It's in Genesis chapter 1. It's at the very beginning. It's the way things were, in fact, in the beginning before sin, before death, when man and woman dwelt intimately with God, it was life as it was meant to be. And to make the point early, it's life as it will be again. Listen to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. This is where David gets what he's saying in Psalm 8. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You hear Psalm 8 in that. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth so that you cannot miss the point, the glory of man exists in being made in the image of God, crowned with honor and glory. Yes. And why? Because though mankind is part of the created order, we're not like the rest of creation, which Genesis says was created according to its kind, its own kind. No, we were created like God. In fact, in Psalm 8, verse 5, I think the translation ought to read, yet you have made him, man, a little lower than God. That's the translation that's right there in my text in the footnote in my copy of the ESV, at least because that's what the Hebrew reads. We are just a little lower than God as the image of God. We have a function. We're supposed to literally image forth God in how we exercise dominion in the world. Or to put it another way, we represent God. I like what one scholar says on this quote, to be in the image of God means that mankind represents God so that what man does is what God himself would do if he ruled the world directly. In other words, our dominion is to be the way by which the nature of God's reign as king of the universe is made known. That's the glory of man, to display who God is in how we live. Just think about that as the basis for all Christian ethics. It is. Only what's the problem? Well, you feel it, don't you? Genesis 1 isn't the world we're living in. 
to put it mildly. Everything is certainly not in subjection under our feet. In fact, quite the opposite. Nature often works against us in response to our rebellion. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, the Lord God said to the man, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. But eat he would. And the impact would be incalculable because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, the Lord God said in Genesis 3, verse 17, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you till you return to the ground, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Calvin says, as soon as Adam cut himself off from God by his sin, he was rightly deprived of all the good things which he had received. It's paradise lost, isn't it? What God intended for man in creation is not what we see, and the disorder runs deeper than we know. So how does the pastor summarize all of this in verse 8 of Hebrews 2 when he then begins to comment on the psalm? You see where in verse 8, this is where we are now, go back to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 verse 8, you see where in verse 8 the quote ends and then the pastor's comment begins. That's where we are. Now, the pastor says, in putting everything in its subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Now, I want you to understand my interpretation of Hebrews at this exact point, dear friends. You may not agree with it, but I at least want you to understand it. As I read it, verses 5 through 8 what we've just been working through of Hebrews 2, 5 to 8, are about men and women, human beings. And what the pastor is saying is that it was to human beings, not to angels, it was to human beings that God subjected the world in creation, according to Psalm 8, and that it will be so again in the world to come. That David could see this. And so Psalm 8 celebrates it. And I think the pastor writing Hebrews now claims it. Look again at the middle of verse 8. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. The him and the his there in that part of verse 8, I think, are referring to man. Coming right out of the context of Psalm 8, that in other words, I think the pastor there is summarizing what the psalm means, that there was to be nothing in this world not under man's dominion. And just let that form your understanding of the world to come, brothers and sisters. Because the point here is that we're destined for something unspeakably great. All in creation is to be put in subjection under our feet. According to the scriptures, we will rule it, not oppressively, but with the righteous, wise, joyful, gentle character of God as the image of God we were originally created to be. In response to that rule, then, all creation will one day serve us completely for a good and joyful end. My mind goes right to Romans chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. Paul says, the creation waits. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
And so we don't even need the pastor to say it, do we? But he does say it anyway. The end of verse 8. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Or as G.K. Chesterton has written, whatever else is true about man, this one thing is certain. Man is not what he was meant to be. So what's the answer? How can David be right in Psalm 8? What about God's creative intention? How will the alleged significance of men and women rooted in creation ever be achieved? Well, I think the answer is in verse 9. Verse 9 of Hebrews 2. But we see him, the pastor proclaims. In verse 9, the pastor uses the language of Psalm 8 and now applies it to Jesus. And you just need to feel a little bit the shift that happens there between verses 8 and 9. At present, verse 8, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, to man. But we see him, him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. That's a reference to the mortal life of Jesus. His life in a world that was under the power of sin and death. That was the, that was the little while he was made lower than the angels. But we see him, namely Jesus. That's the first time that name appears in Hebrews. Crowned with glory and honor, which, of course, he is now. That's where chapter one focused our attention. On Jesus, the resurrected and ascended man, now able to bestow his benefits as a merciful and faithful high priest, as Hebrews will explain. And all of it because, continuing in verse nine, because of the suffering of death. That is Jesus' suffering of death. so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now, as I read it, Psalm 8 itself was not about Jesus, technically. The zero evidence I can find anywhere that Psalm 8 was understood messianically by anyone before Jesus. But Psalm 8 has been fulfilled by Jesus. And that's what the pastor recognizes, as did others in the New Testament era. And probably the most important link to make is with the end of the quote here from Psalm 8 in Hebrews 2, verse 8. What does putting everything in subjection under his feet sound like in the context of Hebrews so far? Well, it sounds like chapter 1, verse 13. It sounds like the climactic scene of the vision of the Son's exalted glory. It sounds like Psalm 110, verse 1. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Do you hear the connection there? The ultimate intention in creation picked up and expressed in Psalm 8 and celebrate is that everything will be in subjection to men and women. Only that hasn't happened clearly. How then is that intention to be fulfilled? It's through the man, Jesus Christ, under whose feet all things will be subjected as Psalm 110 prophesies. And look at What's the one thing above all others which could never be put in subjection under our feet now that sin has entered the world? What is it in our world that mocks this vision in Psalm 8 that David has, that mocks it above everything else? What's at the top of that list? 
What was it that the Lord God said to the man in the garden would be the consequence of eating of that forbidden fruit? You remember it. It's death. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You will not surely die. The serpent counters in Genesis chapter 3, but they would die. The Lord doesn't lie. And the Lord himself would be the one to make sure they die. Genesis 3, verses 22 to 24, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil in that way. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim angels and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so it is the curse of death marks mankind even now with all its frustrations and futility. Far from reigning over the creation, each and every one of us will instead return to the dust from which we came. It's the problem. It's the problem of mankind of all of history. It's the basic problem set forth at the beginning of the Bible, to, the answer to which is unfolded in all the rest of the scriptures. But we see Jesus, pastor says. Hebrews is all about the son bringing about the promise. We don't see Psalm 8 fulfilled in our world or in our experience not yet what we do see now is psalm 8 fulfilled in jesus our salvation as human beings is in the fact that god took on flesh Jesus Christ was the first man to be restored to the destiny of Psalm 8, you see. Because the God who drove man out has made it possible for us to go back in by becoming a man himself and defeating death. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Hebrews has a lot to say about this, including in the rest of chapter 2. But for now, just listen to two final New Testament passages as we close to reinforce what we've seen. First is from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 to 26. Listen to this text. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. What Adam lost, Christ has regained. All who are faithful to him will partake of the glory and honor and dominion that was God's original intention for humanity. And having defeated death itself, what awaits us? Well, it's the promise. <laughs> the promise awaits the world to come. The great salvation. We've read from the very first chapter of the Bible 
Let's conclude now by reading from the last one. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. Then the angel, the angel, the angel that used to keep people out. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb. The throne of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no lamp, light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign. They will reign forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear faithful brother. That we see Jesus, and we're trusting him that uh, I'm muted. I doesn't say no, no, you're, no, you're good, Bishop. Okay. So, did you, did you, <laughs> but we see Jesus. And so in, the, in our synod uh, today, we continue to ask him to lead us. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we uh, thank you that you're building your church. Uh, and we, uh, we want to participate in what you're doing. Uh, uh, as we now have a break and then come back together, we commit ourselves to you afresh in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got 10 minutes off. So at 2.19 Eastern time. And lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to kneel at your throne Father, you love me still And in love before you laid the world's foundation You predestined Adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone Amen You left your home to seek out the lost you knew the greed and terrible cause when Jesus, your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone Jesus, you paid my debt Oh, by your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown and you rose again and died in creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The Spirit, you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone Spirit, you moved in me Oh, I 
at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. Oh, my dark and hard, the light of Christ has shown. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone. I will stand, I will stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace
Well, that uh, it makes breaks even better when you get to sing along and worship with three churches. That was pretty wonderful. And uh, so now we have the work at hand. Uh, and the first thing, I hope you're ready and for some action. The first thing is that we have a motion with regards to the minutes of the past uh, synod, which was 2020. Again, an uh, uh, online synod. Can we have the motion put up? Uh, Scott? Moved by Archdeacon Tim Parent and seconded by, by Canon Chris Deering that the minutes for Synod 2020 be approved as circulated. Okay, uh, let's, are there, is there any uh, discussion? I see a hand up there. Uh, so we'll call on uh, the Reverend Kyle McKenney, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Charlie. Just a quick question on page eight and 10 on the voting results. Um, page eight, it, it looks like, um, I, I would think that our numbers on page eight on the vote should total 100%. Abstentions should probably not affect that voting result on page eight. So I wonder if, um, if those numbers should be corrected to total 100%. Um, on page 10, it's also just a voting question. We, we obviously have to put, uh, pass our canonical changes by house. Yep. And so I'm wondering if the voting table from Chancellor Donison's letter of November 25th, um, it, there, the voting table is very nice in his letter. And I just wonder if that should be reflected into page 10 since we passed it by house. Um, okay. So one and, unanimous uh, and the other one is add the letter from uh, from Chancellor Donison, which gives the breakdown by houses. Yeah, not unanimous, but um, but to total the yeas and nays totaling 100% because abstentions 100%. on page eight wouldn't affect the vote. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I believe those things can be done. Um, so uh, could we have uh, a, a vote uh, as amended? Uh, is, is that what we require here? Uh, so could we have... Uh, 
Um, maybe, Chancellor, you can give me uh, some, can, can we just go straight to the vote or do we need to have a separate vote? I don't believe the chancellor is in the meeting at the moment, Bishop. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, there's the there's the registrar, please, uh, Ken and Tom. I believe if the mover and seconder were in agreement, we could deal with those as friendly amendments. Okay, thank you. Archdeacon Tim, are you okay with, uh, with that change? Uh, yes, I am, Bishop. Thank you, and Ken and Chris Deering, are you okay? Yes, I am, Bishop. Wonderful, you're both good. And thank you, Reverend Kyle. So we're ready, are we ready for the vote to receive the minutes for 2020? Uh, can we have a poll for that? This will be understood as being as amended as we've spoken. All right, I'm launching the poll. Okay, so this is, uh, everybody votes at the same time. So the, the, the minutes for the Synod 2020 be approved as circulated and amended in favor uh, you can now mark that and then you can submit. Okay, we're just letting last few votes come in. Remember to click submit at the bottom to finalize your vote. I'm going to close the poll in 10 seconds. I'm closing the poll now. And I will share the results, Bishop. Yes, please. 100% in 100%. favor. Wonderful. Well done, everyone. And thank you. Thank you for your participation in this. And now uh, I'd like to, uh, Victoria Heyer has put together a, a presentation, which is going to be presented by video, to introduce uh, two motions with regards to canonical changes. So now, Victoria. Good day. I would like to present to you the Canons Committee report and recommendations for Synod 2021. This year, the committee was hoping not to bring any changes to the Canons, given that Synod was already really busy. At the same time, a couple of things happened this year, which made us feel as though it was important that we bring these matters to you today. We made these recommendations to Diocesan Council and diocesan council agreed that they should be voted on at this synod. I'm going to try and provide a brief overview of what those motions are. The first motion is aimed at clarifying who can nominate an Episcopal candidate. And the second one deals with simplifying the standard of proof for the diocesan court. I will start with the changes to clarify who can nominate an Episcopal candidate which is Article 1.4.1.1 sub 3. This motion comes to Synod as a result of some questions around the nomination of Episcopal candidates, which were made this year. Article 1.1.1.3 states that an Episcopal candidate must be nominated by a total of 10 persons. Five persons who are either Anic bishops or Anic clergy, and five parishes and ANIC appointees together. Now, the first change to this provision is in section B that I'm going to discuss. So the question came up this year as to how parishes nominate someone in an Episcopal, to be an Episcopal candidate. Obviously, uh, the parish itself cannot sign the nomination form. Historically, in Anglicanism and also in ANIC, Parishes have been represented by lay synod delegates in these matters. Synod delegates are chosen by their parishes to represent the parish in synodical matters, and the election of a bishop is a synodical matter. Delegates, once they are duly elected or appointed by their parish, are trusted to pray and vote whichever way that they feel that God is leading them. This trust is how all voting at synod takes place, and ultimately the election of the bishop. Likewise, the intention behind the original wording of this provision was to allow lay synod delegates to exercise this discretion in the nomination of an Episcopal candidate. 
Given Anglican custom, as well as our own experience in ANIC in the past, the committee and the diocesan council agree that the intention of the provision should be made clear, and this canon will be modified to make that intention clear. So the canon has been reworded so that B now says, at least five lay synod delegates and ANIC appointees together. We've taken the word parish out as it just causes confusion. Now, in order to avoid further confusion, we have also added a definition of what a lay synod delegate is for the purposes of this section. Uh, so it's very clear as to what a lay synod delegate is. Now, the other change that you will note in the proposed amendment is that Anic Bishop is removed from A. As written, the canons allow Anic Bishops to nominate candidates for Episcopal election. This includes the retiring diocesan. However, the committee and the council feel that active bishops should not be involved in the nomination of their successors, as this can be seen as a potential source of conflict of interest. This amendment would remove Anic Bishops from nominating candidates for Episcopal election. Note that this change does not affect bishops who are continuing to work actively in parish ministry. These bishops are considered clergy under the definition of anic clergy in Article 1. Now, you may be asking, why are we bringing this now? The uh, election is taking place at the Synod. While this is true, there is also the possibility of another Episcopal election in the very near future. We would like to clarify this issue so that um, there are no questions the next time an Episcopal election occurs and that we don't have to scramble to try and fix it should there be another election in the near future. Now, the second amendment before you deals with simplifying the standard of proof for a diocesan court, which is Article 3.4.3. Currently, our canons have a double standard of proof for the court. Uh, for those people who don't know, a standard of proof is the way in which a court determines how convinced they need to be of the person's guilt or innocence. There are two standards of proof listed in the canons. One is called the balance of probabilities. In other words, given the evidence, is it more likely than not that this person is guilty? This is the most common standard of proof that's used in Canada in non-criminal matters. Our canons also provide for another standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. If you've watched any courtroom drama on TV, you will probably recognize this term. This standard of proof means that given the evidence, there is no reasonable question that this person is guilty of what they are accused of. This is the standard of proof that's used in Canada for criminal proceedings. According to our canons, the beyond a reasonable doubt standard is to be used if there is a likelihood of suspension for life or disposition of ministry, which are quite serious sentences that the bishop can apply to somebody who has been found guilty by the diocesan court. Now, there are problems with having uh, a double standard. And this stems from the pact primarily that an ecclesiastical court does not work the same way as a regular law court. Again, if you've watched any TV drama or have gone to court, you will know that in civil and criminal matters both, the judge hears the evidence and then passes the sentence. Criminal court judges use the beyond a reasonable doubt standard and the non-criminal judges will use the balance of probability standards. In However, having two standards of proof for the diocesan court is very challenging. Members of the court, unlike a traditional judge in a law court, must keep the two standards of proof in mind as they go through the trial to determine which standard is being met. Now, why is this problematical? See, the thing is that in an ecclesiastical court, the court listens to the evidence and the defense and determines the innocent or innocence or guilt of the person in question. However, the bishop is the person who determines what the sentence is. The bishop is not part of the court and does not hear the evidence. 
unlike a judge in a law court where the judge is there and hears all of the evidence and makes a determination based upon which the standard of proof for the matter before them. This creates it extremely complicated for people who are on the diocesan court to determine which standard of proof that they should be measuring against. They have to sort of keep everything in mind and with the possibility, like would the bishop want to use the sentence of disposition of ministry or suspension of life, of life, for life, excuse me. So, um, you know, it's really hard to read the mind of a bishop in advance. And so you are asking something difficult of the members of the court. The second problem with having a double standard of proof in our court is that having had feedback from people who have been involved in the ecclesiastical courts, it is essentially impossible for a diocesan court to meet the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. It's hard enough in criminal cases and diocesan courts do not have the same powers as a criminal court. It is quite likely that uh, they cannot compel witnesses to come forward uh, or to provide testimony. And as such, the diocesan court may not get all the evidence required to meet the stricter standard of proof. And of course, if the stricter standard cannot be met, then an appropriate sentence may not be possible. Now, you're kind of asking, I'm sure, why this is urgent for this synod. Well, the ACNA province has made a decision that every diocese, diocese excuse me, needs to have a functioning court, should it be needed. And it has become a high priority for the province. Therefore, it becomes a high priority for us as a diocese to get this sorted out. Um, the diocese needs to be prepared should we ever need an operational court. So in the same way as you would plan for a way to get out of your house in case of a fire, we need to plan to make sure that everything's in place should we need it. While in one sense, you can argue that this plan, fire plan, if you will, could wait another year, the province does not want us to wait on this matter. Therefore, we need to vote on it at this synod. So the new change to the canon would basically remove the stricter standard of proof, the beyond a reasonable doubt, and just have one standard of proof being the balance of probabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Wow, that's, uh, that's masterful to be able to walk us through two very different uh, items. And uh, so we're going to go straight to uh, the, the first motion, which has to do with who can nominate uh, for an Episcopal election. Uh, and could I have the motion put up, uh, moved by Canon Tom Carmen, seconded by Evan Baker, Whereas the Canons Committee has submitted its report to the Senate and proposed changes to Article 4, Canon 1.4.1.1, subsection 3, to remove any potential conflict of interest or perceived inappropriateness over active Annic bishops nominating an Episcopal candidate, and to clarify who in the category of laity are able to vote toward a nomination for an Episcopal election, be it resolved that the proposed change number one to the Annic Canons and bylaws in the report of the Canons Committee to Synod 2021 be adopted as circulated. Uh, okay, so uh, do either the mover or the seconder want to say anything to this? Please, Canon Tom. Just to uh, point out that uh, uh, in uh, a correction to what was given in the report, uh, that the canon that we're referring with is Article 4 of our canons, Canon 1.4.1.1, subsection 3. Uh, the number 4 was missing in the report and in the uh, PowerPoint presentation there. Uh, it's Article 4, and then the canon number is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does the seconder want to say anything uh, to this? Uh, we, we have it moved and seconded, uh, and uh, 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 is there any anyone want to say or ask or, or say anything before we go to the vote? 
I see uh, Mike Tweedle, I believe, as, as sir. Thank you, my bishop. Um, thank you very much for all the work on this, and I appreciate the intricacies. Uh, there's one little issue I have with the actual English, and maybe it's just uh, being picky, but in the description of a lay synod delegate, the second sentence, it goes from the singular to the plural to the singular again. If, is there a way to correct that? And I'm assuming that's because of he and she, that we use the they. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ken and Tom, do you have any comment on that? This is kind of wordsmithing in terms of it's I'm not- just looking hard. this up now. Um, Sorry, Mike, can you explain, uh, point out the paragraph? It goes from the plural to the singular to the plural, I think. Yes, but in which paragraph? Uh, I, I, see, uh, oh, Victoria, I see Victoria has her hand up. So would you like to speak to this, Victoria? If I may, Bishop. Yes, please. Uh, so it is exactly as Mike said, the plural is used there as a way of, um, it's the singular plural, it's the gender neutral way instead of using he or she, which is generally now used in legal drafting. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so are there any other further comments, questions of the house? Now this is a canonical issue so that we have to vote by houses. Uh, and I see Archdeacon Michael, please. Thank you, Bishop. I just a uh, point of clarification, although a bishop um, is not allowed to nominate, uh, they are allowed to vote in the election. Is that correct? Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Bishop. That's correct. Okay, so now because it's a, a canonical vote, uh, that's three houses, bishops, and then clergy and laity. I think we'll start with laity first. Are we ready for for the vote and and you as Scott is there any preference as to which order we go uh, uh, Bishop just to clarify in this case the, the bishops will vote separate from the clergy uh, I, I believe that's correct for if so we just need to create quickly need to create a separate poll for them okay so how we don't have that prepared start, how about if we start laity uh, yeah this is unlike an election this is a canonical change so I believe that we need to do that so could we have the laity up first yes So this will be for lay delegates only. Only. You did so, so well in the city, folks. Let's keep it going. Please vote only if you are a lay delegate. Delegate, please vote in favor of the motion of this change. Now is the time to click in favor or opposed and then submit. Lay the only. Going to give a few moments more for everyone to complete their vote. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. And Bishop, we will share the results at the end. Is or I, I, I guess that's true. Now I see someone's hand up, and I, I'm kind of caught. Uh, we did end the the discussion. Is there a clarification here, or what's? Please, okay. Would you speak to this? Simple clarification, Bishop. Thank you for for recognizing me, and sorry for jumping in late. Uh, just the motion, as it was stated, was was updated by the the offerer of the motion. Uh, the the person who seconded it did not did not state that that they were in agreement with the offerer of the motion who amended it. So right now we are a bit afoul of Roberts or Mason's rules. And I just wanted to make sure that both the offerer and the uh, and the seconder of the motion agreed to the amendment, such that we vote on uh, a a correct uh, amendment. Thank okay. you. I will I will allow that, and we're going to assuming we get a yes to that, we're going to count on the laity as is counted. Can I have the mover? Uh, are we good? A hand up. Can you just does that mean yes? And the seconder, Evan, is that a yes too? So we have two uh, yes. Actually, a correction to what. Uh, Peter said that the motion was not changed, 
the, it was a correction to the report that was given to Synod, but the motion as it was submitted uh, for, for being presented to Synod uh, has been the same all along. Okay, uh, I, I, um... I just corrected the language that was in the report, um, okay. but that was okay. correct, correct from the beginning in the motion. That's number four that you were talking about. Very good. Okay. So we're, we're good on this and we've had the vote for the laity. We're now going to do the clergy, but not bishops. Can we have that one, please? Uh, Scott. Yes. So again, this is for clergy delegates clergy only. only. And, uh, and uh, so this is not bishops, but all clergy only in favor or opposed. Would you please vote and submit? going to give 10 more seconds. So please finalize your votes. And I'm closing the poll now. Thank you. Okay. And do you have, uh, have you been able to put together? Uh, I have bishops. So yes, I think we uh, can do one for the bishops now as well. Yes, we like to participate. <laughs> All right, so this vote is for bishops only, please. Okay, so bishops, here we go. And yes, I realize now that bishops delegate is a strange way of writing that, but I was doing it quickly. <laughs> All right, and I can see that all of our so bishops. We, uh, can we have the results? This is for motion one. Uh, for first laity. For laity. I will share the results now. 100%. Okay. 100% in favor. Okay. For laity for the clergy. Ninety-four percent yes, six percent no, and bishops. And for the bishops, hundred percent. Okay, that means the motion is passed, and we're now move on to motion number two, which is could you have that one posted, Scott, please, concerning yes. ecclesiastical court, and the burden of of evidence. Is that, I'm not sure if that's called correctly. Again, moved by, uh, oh, uh, moved by Canon Chris Deering and seconded by Canon Tom Carmen. Whereas the standard of proof required as a threshold for a guilty verdict in Canadian law is in non-criminal and administrative proceedings is on a balance of probabilities. And whereas the Dawson Bishop does not serve on the Dawson court and does not determine sentencing under uh, until after trial, and whereas the cur current dual standard of proof creates serious difficulties for the Dawson court in having to constantly measure the evidence against two standards of proof, and whereas a standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt is such a high requirement that it would be virtually impossible to meet at trial, be it resolved that the proposed change number two to the can canons and bylaws in the report of the canons committee to Synod 2021 be adopted as circulated. So that's moved by Canon Chris Deering, seconded by Canon Tom Carmen. Do either of you want to speak uh, to this? I see, uh, uh, I can't see who that is. Oh, that's Kyle McKenney, the Reverend Kyle McKenney, sir. And then, uh, I, I, and then I'll see, maybe I got them in the wrong order, but I called on you first, Kyle, and then uh, Reverend Rich, Richard White next. Kyle, please. Thanks, Bishop. I, I had a nice chat with um, Victoria over email as Canon's chair. I. I just am in concern, and I mentioned this uh, with her, but I'm concerned that we're not talking yet about the ACNA canon uh, that relates to all of this. This is ACNA canon 4.5, which I know that obviously the can canons committee is well aware of, and, and maybe even diocesan council has discussed this, but what, what ACNA canon 4.5 says is that in all courts of original jurisdiction, which would include our diocesan court that's being set up, and obviously I'm very in favor of the court, but in all courts of original jurisdiction, the standard of proof shall be by clear and convincing evidence. 
Um, that's the ACNA language. What's, what's troublesome is that that's an American term that has been very infrequently applied in Canada. Um, but clear and convincing evidence by, from ACNA canons is actually a higher, it's a higher burden of proof or a higher standard of proof. And for us to then just try to adopt across the board a lower standard than what ACNA canon 4.5 instructs, I, I, I'm just quite hesitant about it. So I just need to, need to say that. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think what was, I mean, I've seen presentations on it and I'm not qualified really, but just to say that it was certainly perceived this as being less than beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, that, that was the clear and convincing uh, is not as high as beyond a reasonable doubt. So that I think possibly the Kenneth Committee was taking standards which are what we have in Canada and ultimately went for uh, for the one which was, in their view, reasonable for how we could operate. Uh, I, I will allow the uh, Victoria or Canada's committee, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, then otherwise, I will look to Rich, uh, the Reverend Richard White. And then, uh, sorry, uh, Chancellor, are you, do you want to speak to in response to Mr. McKenney's uh, thing? Okay, could you do that now? Yes, unless, of course, Victoria wants to speak to it. Just, just on the point that Carl made, which is an excellent point. Um, there is this principle of subsidiarity. And I've had some discussions, since I said on the government's task force, of the province. And there is no problem there. That We're not in a situation where the provincial canon will now be in conflict with the diocesan canon. Uh, the principle of subsidiarity, and it's their view, that Canada can have a different test. Right, we're not stuck with the provincial. That that's an American test, although it's used in some police cases in Canada. But it's not known to our jurisprudence, and um, therefore I don't think there's any direct. Kyle's raised a very good point, but it doesn't create an, actually a direct conflict. If it did, then we'd have an issue. So, and that's certainly the advice I've got, uh, and that's my view of it as well. Just for what that's worth. Thank you very much. I'm going to call on the Reverend Richard White, and I've asked. I should have been doing this all along. Uh, which is, could you say your name and where you're from, what church you're from before you speak? Uh, Richard, you just need to unmute your microphone. Reverend Richard White, uh, representing the uh, parish of Church of the Good Shepherd in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Uh, thank you, Bishop, for recognizing me. I have a question, and this... Uh, comes more from ignorance than anything else. I have served in different provinces in my years of ministry, and I just need clarification here. Um, what powers does a bishop have, uh, regardless of whether or not there is a, a court? And secondly, and this is related, what under what circumstances would a court be called? I have seen bishops uh, exercise a fair amount of power in uh, other jurisdictions, and uh, in, in neither case that I have in mind was a court called. Um, so I need some clarification. Chancellor or Victoria, would either of you like to speak to this? Thank you, Chancellor, please. If you can unmute yourself, that would be good. Work. It keeps telling me, oh, there I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that, 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 is, that, is, that is a very good, good question. Uh, for one thing, our canons, if you read them, do set out some of the tests in terms of the need for a canonical investigator followed by presentment and so on. So it's not just a question of the bishop. But I think the other question is what powers a diocesan bishop has to discipline clergy short of following a, a trial discipline. And there, there, there is indeed, there's what's called an inhibition. There's, there's a godly admonition where a bishop can simply say to a clergy, you should stop doing this and start doing that. And there's also the power of an inhibition. Certainly in emergency cases, a bishop has the power to inhibit and prevent a member of the clergy carrying out their duties if the bishop is of the view that there is clear and present danger either to his congregation or, or to the diocese. And that could then be pending a further litigation. So there is a power of a bishop to exercise some discipline prior to there actually being a formal trial. And that's provided uh, in the canons, provincially and federally. Thank you. 
And she's not, no, I saw Jeff Wilson before I saw Peter Fagan. Jeff Wilson, can you say who you are and where you're from? I am worried about timing here, folks. So if we can move along, that would be great. Jeff, please. Thank you, Your Grace. Um, I'm Jeff Wilson, representing St. Matthew's in Abbotsford. Um, I just have a question about the standard of evidence required at trial. Um, usually in, um, in employment scenarios, um, uh, you know, it's the, the legal uh, framework isn't used, but as you rightly said, it's the balance of probabilities. And I'm just wondering here, since um, a minister's license is directly tied to their ability to serve in, as a role um, as licensed clergy, um, and this would probably be a question for Michael Donison. Um, how does that affect or how does that interplay with the employment relationship? I, I guess that would be my only concern. Thank you. Chancellor, can you unmute yourself? And Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, I don't want to prolong this, Bishop, because we want to get on with it, but we've got to understand the purpose of ecclesiastical trial is to deal with the orders. It's ecclesiastical matter. The employment matter, of course, is our, our several courts deal with. So the fact that the civil law may deal with a dismissal in our secular law does not inhibit an ecclesiastical court uh, from doing something else. The test of an ecclesiastical court is, is not whether they breach their terms of employment civilly, but whether they have breached the canons of good order and discipline totally different matter. And so an uh, ecclesiastical court could discipline uh, a clergy person um, and, and for doing something, including preventing them from carrying out their duties, or a civil court might, might take a total different view and regard it as one of wrongful dismissal. That's just an issue we're, we're already facing. But the fact is the ecclesiastical court is, is different from a civil court. And Victoria may want to say something more on that. I uh, perhaps not necessary. Uh, can we move on, uh, Mr. Fagan? Would you like to speak? Uh, uh, unmute yourself. Say where you're from. Thank you, Bishop Peter Fagan. I almost said representative. Sorry, Peter Fagan, uh, Rutland, Vermont, All Saints Anglican Church. Uh, I am the rector's warden. Thank you for, for allowing me to ask this question because I want to ask how this pertains to the United States. The first resolve stated in Canada. And then the, uh, the I'm sorry, the first whereas stated in Canada, and then the resolve did not address. So um, I'd like to know how this uh, is overlaid here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. That is a, tr a tricky one in that we do have some parishes like All Saints Rutland uh, that are in the States. Uh, I don't know if we're able to speak to that, uh, Chancellor or Victoria. Um, clearly, the vast majority of what we're thinking of uh, is the Anglican Network in Canada is thinking of Canada, so you understand that. Is there anything to be said, uh, Archdeacon? Do you want to speak to it? Uh, I, I was just going to say we don't do anything wrong anyway down here, so it, it's mute. It's a moot point. Very helpful, Victoria. Would you like <laughs> to speak to that if in, in the unlikely event? Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the very, very, very unlikely event, apparently, that uh, something would happen in the United States parishes that we have, they are subject to the canons of ANIC because they are under our diocese. And so even though they are in, in the United States and slightly different, the majority of the court would likely be made up of Canadians. And uh, so we would follow the canons as they are written for ANIC. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to call for, well done. I'm going to call for the vote now. Uh, uh, and uh, so could we have, we're going to do uh, again, uh, uh, I think, I think we'll go by laity, clergy, bishops, as we did the last one. This is a canonical change. So that requires all three houses. Are we ready for the laity first? All right. I'll launch the poll now. This is for only lay delegates. Only, please. Uh, in favor or opposed and submit, lay only. Can I close the poll in 10 seconds? Please finalize your vote.
I'm closing the poll now. Okay, so then are we ready to go on to uh, clergy? We can move to the clergy, yes. Not, not bishops, clergy, but all the other clergy. All right, I'm gonna launch the poll for clergy. Again, if you're clergy in favor or opposed and submit. I'm gonna close the poll in 10 seconds. Please finalize your votes. And I'm closing the poll now. And now the bishops. For bishops. This is for bishops only, please. Favor or oppose and submit. And I'm going to close the poll now. And are we ready to share the results, Bishop? Please go laity first. Yes. For the laity. So it's 96% yes, 4% no for canon number two, Ch canon change number two for clergy. For the clergy. 93% yes in favor, 7% no. And now for bishops. And for bishops. 100% yes. In other words, this second motion has passed. Thank you very much to the Canons Committee for these very tricky issues and important. Uh, and we're grateful for you bringing them to us. Now, folks, I am worried about timing. Uh, and I... Uh, uh, we have a number of important things yet to be done. Um, so I, I'm going to, if this is okay, I'd like to just have a two minute break and then I'm gonna call on Bishop Stephen and the ordination task force. We're gonna keep going through uh, for after two minutes. So this is run to the washroom if you need to. Uh, and then we're gonna come back and make our way and, and uh, try to get done close to the time. I know that throws off music and so on, I apologize. Just two minutes.
Now, I, I don't know if I'm able to speak yet, Scott, am I? Yes, you are, Bishop. Okay. Dear friends, thanks for coming back. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, uh, that hand I see that, uh, is that, okay, then we're carrying on. And uh, we, we, uh, we have important things to do here, folks. Uh, and so now, uh, is there, is that uh, Ken and Barkley Mayo? Is there something that you need to? Bishop, just a question, Bishop. Are you, uh, is it your intent to give assent to all the motions at the end of the yes, meeting today? Okay. Yes, Thanks. yes it is. Uh, okay, that, that is required. Um, so we're now moving on to, uh, uh, to the uh, ordination. In my charge, I pointed out that there were two steps taken with regards to theological education. One was that led to a seminary working group uh, in the announcement of this exciting announcement of Packer College. Uh, the second one, or actually, which was the first one, was the calling of a task force, Bishop Stephen Leong to lead an excellent group to work on the whole area. And so I'm gonna call on Bishop Stephen, and I know there's a number of his, of his committee who are gonna be speaking as well. So Bishop Stephen, I hand it over to you and welcome and thank you. Thank you, Bishop uh, Charlie and uh, dear Synod members, uh, Bishop Clergy and Lay. Um, Bishop Charlie appointed me to chair the task force and I want to uh, make, uh, make sure everyone understand the name of the task force is the task force of ordination, clergy training and theological education for two years term. Uh, so we begin from January 2020, and then we're going to finish the term in December 2022. Now, having said that, I need to say it's a very wide scope of uh, ministry. So for the past almost a year, we are very focusing, we're only focusing on um, ordination and clergy training. We haven't finished anything, everything, but we'll look into the theological education next year. I need to uh, introduce uh, the task force members. Uh, they are Archdeacon Daryl Critch, Reverend Keith Ganser, Reverend David Penelegion, th those are from the East, and then Archdeacon Terry Lamb, uh, Reverend Kenan David Short, uh, Reverend Kenner Spray, they are from the, from the West. And then later on, we add Reverend Sonnoff because uh, Anna, now become our part-time project staff of the task force. Uh, it's because I think uh, we now think about to implement some of our uh, discussions into next year into action. Uh, namely, uh, one of the examples would be, uh, we're going to hold uh, two conferences, one in the East and one in, in the West uh, to educate and also to help people come into the understanding of ordination. Now, this is a very strong team. Uh, they are uh, fully equipped in theological education, rich experience in, experiences in pastoral ministry. And uh, when we come together, they have a very good insights. And I discovered that uh, they have a great passion uh, to bring up the new generation of leaders. So I just want to say that as a chair of this committee, uh, the thing I learned is to listen and listen and listen because they have a lot of great ideas and try to facilitate them uh, and make sure whatever we talk come into plan and then into action. So I just want to say it is a joyful working uh, fellowship. Now, before I pass to um, my team members to do the presentation, I want to um, lay down uh, the mandate or objectives of the task force, which uh, have been passed by the House of Bishops, the ASEAN Council, 
And uh, once a while we've been presented in East-West uh, clergy gatherings. And let me say that for uh, mandates. The first one is to devise a comprehensive plan of discernment for the candidates, the parish church plans, and the diocese, means in the house of bishops, in the ordination of deacon, including vocational and transitional, and then the priests. The second mandate is to define the role and responsibility of Duff in the ordination process. Third, lay down guidelines on how to raise up godly servants in response to God's calling through theological education and communal life. And fourth, the last one, define minimum standards, create a template to help parishes in the discernment process carry out across ENIC for consistency, produce materials with detailed criteria for each step to be followed. Now you probably ask me what we have done or achieved last 10 months. I'm going to pass the time to Canon David Sword and Arch Archdeacon Terry Lamb, the chair of the Duff, to brief you what we have done. And then I'm going to also ask Reverend David Pendilajun, who are going to share with you one of our document, finished documents is the document of examination and questions, which can be applied uh, to, to implement to be in use next year, which is actually already uh, passed uh, by the House of Bishops. Um, and then at the end, I think Anne, Anna, we're going to uh, answer some of the raised questions uh, from the diocese. So I now I pass the time to David Sword and Terry Lamb. Thank you so much, Bishop Stephen. Uh, this is an exciting priority that Bishop Charlie has set for us uh, to take the really good work that's been done in the past and to strengthen and give clarity and transparency and uh, standardize it, and we need a clear process that is going to serve all of ANIC in these areas of discernment, ordination, training, and support. We have brilliant canons. Our canons on training and ordination are exceptional, and we want to try to find a way of bringing them into practice and raising up the next generation. Our opportunity and our need are very clear. Um, we, are, we have over 200 clergy who are at least as old as I am, most of them, and we only have 50 churches. And we need training churches and to become a training diocese. And that means local churches equipped to raise up next generation clergy. So we need to standardise Dove across the country and apply the standards of the canons. I wonder if you could um, move to the next slide, please. So we're gonna try and create uh, best documents and best processes uh, that will secure the gospel for the next generation. If I could have the next slide, thank you. But all the best documents and processes cannot secure the gospel. We are absolutely dependent on God, completely dependent on God. And uh, this synod has been a great experience of that, I think. Um, on the sixth slide, the next slide, our first, in our first year, we've looked at the components that need clarity and standardization across the country. So the ordination, um, theological tasks, theological issues in education and clergy training, both before and after ordination. So where we're focusing right now is on the first two. On the next slide, you'll see the key stakeholders in the process. And as you look across the screen there, um, one of the most important things we've learned is that the initial discernment needs to play, take place within congregations. Discernment isn't just a, an individual thing where the person expresses what they feel. 
it's what the body of Christ discerns. And I think there are many parishes uh, who, many of us who don't feel equipped to discern. So we want to try and find a way of strengthening, encouraging and equipping parishes to identify and raise up uh, new leaders for the future, to create a best practice template that we can give to clergy and to uh, parish committees for discernment. And as Stephen, Bishop Stephen mentioned, we're going to create an annual conference in the East and the West for future leaders, for young people who are considering full-time ordination within ANIC. Now, on the next slide, we mentioned Dove, and it's been very difficult for Dove to receive um, ordinands when it's not, when there hasn't been a clear discernment of that person from the parish. So I'm going to hand over to Terry Lamb now, our Archdeacon, to uh, talk a little bit about the work of Dove and what this process is going to mean for Dove. Thank you, David. Um, Scott, if you could just move to the next slide. I'm hoping I have all my slides in order here. Um, uh, um, I just also want to give a shout out to those who have gone before us in this whole Dove process. I think of um, uh, Archie Pell, who um, had great passion for it. Um, Paul Crossland, who um, really helped mobilize. And of course, our, our dear Bishop Trevor Walters, who really has a passion to see ordination of, um, um, in our diocese. So I want to say that uh, first and foremost. The discernment of vocation and evaluation. This committee is convened by the examining chaplain and meets annually to review each applicant's documents and re review them. Once a consensus on each candidate has been reached, they are sent their finding, we send their finding, findings to the bishop and examining chaplain for review. Next slide, Scott. The process has gone something like this. And again, it's kind of, it's a thumbnail sketch. Um, I inherited it from uh, Archie Pell, the examining chaplain before me. And it went something like this in April, uh, we write to parishes and remind them there's an upcoming dove that, um, and they need to get uh, up and running. If they have someone they are sending, they need to have all their approval letters um, by the congregation, the bishop. In June, another reminder to the parish goes out uh, and we contact the uh, candidate. July, another reminder goes out. You can see I send a lot of reminders out, can't you? Um, and start making travel arrangements to Vancouver. Church of the Good Shepherd and Bishop Stephen has been so kind to us to host this every year. And in August, somewhere around the third week, the Dove convenes. Um, the cons are uh, paperwork is uh, usually a hassle. It's not gotten in on time. It's a little bit lackadaisical. Um, I, I believe Anna was reading the last Dove that we convened. She was reading some of the candidates profile on the way over from the ferry from uh, Victoria to Vancouver. And so we just want to make the process a little more detailed. We want to move it to a three-year timeline uh, with regular annual intake applications and a standardized ordination dates set annually. Parishes will be uh, given a detailed pro process to follow for this discernment committee. Um, this discernment committee will meet with the candidates for a total of 12 times over 36 months and submit regular reports to the examining chaplain and the bishop. The ordaining bishop will have regular and annual contact with each candidate, but the weight will not be borne by him alone. It will be borne by us first and then passed on to him. The dev committee will um, not interview a candidate until all the pertinent documents and evaluations are complete. They will receive ample preparation for more in-depth depth documentation before initiating a review. Ordination will happen only after a three-year process is complete, including all relevant documentation, ordination exam, and other evaluations. Each candidate will attend an annual ministry conference for training and mentorship. Next slide, if you could. 
Once all steps of the process are adhered to and the candidate has met the requirements, including uh, pertinent documentation, supervised ministry in the parish and educational criteria, ordination exam, DOV, and annual ministry conference and date of the ordination may be determined. Annual dates for the ordination will be established for both East and West. Next slide. Post-ordination training. An annual ministry conference will occur each year to provide training and mentorship and continue education for all new ordinands and prospective candidates. Next slide. How might we uh, revive and expand this ministry of vocational, the vocational diaconate? And I just wanna put a plug in here for the vocational diaconate. At Resurrection Anglican, where I was the rector, we have um, an amazing deacon. His name is Jonathan Weeb. I don't know if he's um, on uh, uh, with the Senate this morning, but I just want to say that he has been so invaluable as a deacon. He sees his calling as a vocational deacon, and I'm sure if you looked up in the dictionary, vocational deacon, Jonathan's picture would be right beside it. He does such a good job of being a vocational deacon. He takes it very seriously. And as Bishop laid hands on him to become a vocational deacon, um, he, he said to me, Terry, I was changed in that very moment. I knew this is my calling for the rest of my life. And so I am excited to see vocational deacons all across Canada, you know, take up the call to be one and hear the call of God to be a vocational deacon. Uh, it's an essential and historic ministry of the church in view of the dire need of uh, evangelistic outreach and um, disciple making in North American culture, we need to deploy a more diverse team of laborers for God's kingdom harvest. We will need to launch a discernment process of ordination to non-stipend permanent deacons to serve in Anic, church, in Anic churches. Uh, this, uh, this is work for uh, the years ahead. And I believe this is um, where David Penny Legion takes over. Uh, sorry, Terry. No, uh, David's going to take over when we get to the ordination exam portion. But just to quickly say that part of our future work is also to work on uh, lay licensing. Um, this is something that Daryl Critch has done considerable work on, and uh, that's that's for rollout later. So we just didn't want to forget that. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Scott? So uh, this is just uh, to sum up sort of five new commitments. If you can get to the next slide, please, Scott. Thank you. So as, as um, we sort of outlined, we're creating new resources for parishes and church plants. Uh, we want to help facilitate and resource parishes so that they can guide through a candidate through discernment and training and feel amply supported. Um, we hope to raise the profile of lay ministry. As Terry said, we really want to see the revival of um, vocational deacon and lay licensing and seeing those ministries activated in local parishes. Um, we're hoping to further strengthen the examining chaplain role to clarify how, how this process unfolds, um, to provide specific communication, commitment, and prayer to the ordination process. And again, this annual ministry conference is a commitment that we have going forward as well. Can you move to the next slide, please, Scott? So uh, I'm sure there's a lot more to say on this, and it's always we're pressed for time. But really, the guiding principles that has led us um, through this work thus far is wanting to build upon the foundation that's already been laid, and then upon that, provide clarity, consistency, and revitalization to um, ordination for priests, deacons, and for lay licensing. So this just sums up some of the changes that we're looking forward to and and the way that we've arrived at that place. Uh, next slide, please, Scott. So now, uh, David Penny Legion, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so one of the things that we discovered, as David mentioned, uh, we have wonderful canons uh, related to the ordination process within ANIC already. And, and those canons explicitly state 
that one being ordained to the diaconate or as a presbyter uh, is to have passed an examination uh, conducted by those who are appointed by the bishop on uh, topics of importance. Uh, and so this would be true of someone who's being ordained to the vocational diaconate, the transitional diaconate, or as a presbyter. Um, and so to satisfy this, uh, we have drafted a uh, ordination exam uh, based around the areas that the, the canons uh, outline for us. Uh, Scott, if you could go to the next slide, please. So on your screen, you can see the uh, different areas that are laid out by the, the canons that uh, each person that is seeking ordination is meant to be um, familiar with and uh, be examined on. So we have Holy Scripture, uh, Church and Anglican Church History, Doctrine, Liturgics, Moral Theology and Ethics, Aesthetical Theology, practical theology, the mission work of the church, and pastoral care. And so what we have done is create an ordination exam that is structured around these 10 different areas with questions in each. Uh, each of the sections have questions that are uh, mandatory to be answered, and then some that have some choice. So for example, um, you know, uh, in a list of three questions, choose one of the following to respond to. Um, the purpose, again, is to, one, fulfill the canonical requirement that already exists, um, but also to identify uh, potential red flags in, in a candidate's theology or doctrine that we really would need to be addressing or, or aware of, uh, certainly before they're ordained, uh, but also to assist the discernment and the assessment process so that uh, our examining chaplains and our dove assessors have uh, more data, essentially, so that they know more about the person that they're they're interacting with and some of their uh, what some of their theology might be. Um, and so, along with this, there are uh, questions that are given to the assessors uh, that are uh, related to exam questions, but can be good follow up questions. Uh, also, the assessors would have the responses from the exam, and so they could uh, interact with the candidates on uh, the questions that they didn't answer. Uh, so we are we get a fuller picture uh, of this person's theology before a recommendation is made to the House of Bishops. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thanks, David. Yeah. And I see that uh, Alan Mills has his hand up. Alan, maybe you'd like to get us started with our question and answer portion. Sure, thank you, uh, Alan Mills, uh, Canadian Armed Forces Chaplain. And, and a priest uh, as one, this is tremendous work. I love it. It's very, very exciting to me. And I commend your committee for the, the great uh, work that's already in place. I'm excited how it's gonna develop. Um, as a who has come into Anik from a non-Episcopal tradition and been Anik um, and was received, and did my own, did formation for that and so on. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about how this process is gonna to apply to similar kinds of candidates, which I hope will come into ANIC mm -hmm. from other traditions that are, that are non-Episcopal, but will be required to have Episcopal ordination. And so it's a really just, um, really just a request that uh, that be considered in your deliberations. And I'd be happy to be engaged with that at any point if, that's something that you wanted to uh, explore or work on. So that's my comment slash question slash hope. Well, that's helpful, Alan, thank you. Um, that has definitely been a part of our conversations. <laughs> I think for us, um, what we realize is everybody's situation is so different um, that it's hard to speak to the multiplicity of differences that might arise. Um, so certainly we, we acknowledge that there's gonna to need to be some individual work done according to the individual candidate. I think what we've tried to do in this first year of work is try to establish sort of a, a general standard across the board. And then beyond that, we will have to address um, people's particularities uh, of their individual circumstances. 
Um, now, how we formulate <laughs> processes and proceeds according to that is, is going to be tricky, right? Because we're, we're going to have to treat people as individuals. Um, but so, yeah, that's definitely part of our conversation going forward. And I'm writing your name down that you <laughs> volunteered yourself. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Chris, how about you next? Thank you. Just a quick question. Um, what is kind of the projected full length of that process of ordination from initial discernment of an individual seminary, then this 36 week discernment process? What's kind of the full picture and what are the checks and balances along the way? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, uh, definitely some of the timelines can run concurrently. So we are anticipating that people likely will already begun um, a process of education before their application for ordination. Um, for our processes, we're realizing that we need a minimum of 36 months to ensure that all the checks and balances apply. So as you questioned, um, we have ordination exam to be administered. There's going to be a psychological evaluation of some sort along the way. Um, there's all the parish reporting that needs to take place every year. Um, so really, the, the 36 month timeline is just to stretch things out so that we have enough time to really see that all those individual pieces are put into place. Um, and again, as I was saying to Alan, we know that there's going to be particular differences according to the applicant. Some people might have already completed seminary before their application for ordination. Um, and we're, we're just going to have to be able to be sensitive to those needs. So thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I believe. Uh, uh, oh, yes. I'm sorry. I just want to say that maybe five minutes more. I realize you have uh, Ray, but if, if yeah, you carry on, but we, we have limited time, as you know, please. Sure. Uh, I think we'll go to Ken Deeks next. Uh, thank you. Um, question about the um, the examination. Um, who would who would ultimately approve uh, the examination, and will there be a rubric that will define the range of acceptable answers? Just given the different churchmanships within Anglicanism, I'm thinking of sacramental theology especially, um, will there be a rubric that will define the range of acceptable answers? And will there be steps taken to ensure that various streams are represented at each dove in terms of assessors so that answers can be filtered through the grid of various people? Yeah, that's a great question, Ken. Thank you. Um, ultimately, um, as, as David said, we've submitted questions for the exam, but it's ultimately the bishop's purview to sign off on what the questions can be. And I'm wondering, Bishop Stephen, if, if maybe you can speak to the second half of Ken's question regarding, regarding the three streams identity? Um. Can, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, well, I think we haven't, uh, we still have to discuss in details. We haven't come to that. But obviously, uh, we'll be before the Duff, in the Duff, and then uh, back to the House of Bishops. There will be a process. And I think we'll consider what uh, just Ken mentioned. And uh, I, I just want to say, Anik has a great strength with people coming from all different backgrounds, but coming into uh, Anglicanism. I think we treasure that and we kind of like uh, encouraging that, we're not discouraging them. And then I think also remember that the examination is only is an open book and uh, it's not like examination as such, meaning we want to know the candidate, what are in their mind. And it's a very good exercise to, uh, to organize and present, and same as the, uh, the deaf people. I mean, we all will get through some kind of philological uh, process to learn more. So I think it will be very beneficial to everyone, even I think including the House of Bishops. So I see it more positively instead of, you know, trying to defeat people. Thank you, Bishop Stephen. Uh, I think we'll go to Ian Henderson next, and we may be out of time after that. Sorry, friends. Ian, do you want to go? Thank you very much. Um, as a theological educator, this is very exciting to me. 
<laughs> but I've recently been uh, scared by some conversations. Are the criteria for discernment of vocation in ANIC different for women than they are for men? Uh, as far as I am to my knowledge, no. Um, a lot of our work is wanting to level the playing field and make it clear that regardless uh, of who you are and your experience and background, we want to evaluate people based on their merits, regardless of whether they are women or men. Thanks, Ian. Um, and maybe Rob Collis will go to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rob from St. Peter's Fire in Vancouver. Uh, I have one quick question. I, I love the fact that we are seeking to um, honor and respect uh, the ordination process and that we have a very high standard and that we're trying to standardize it. Uh, I think that's a really good thing. My my question, which I haven't yet heard uh, speak to, is we've, we've mentioned the, the fact that red flags may come up, um, but what is the process for people who do not make it through Dove? What commitment are we seeking to make to those who um, do go through the ordination process, but for whom we say, actually, we don't think that we agree with this calling on your life? Yeah, that's a great question, Rob. Thank you. Um, Terry, perhaps, Terry Lamb, maybe you could speak to that. Um, we we are hoping as we uh, tighten up the discerning of uh, as the uh, candidate is being discerned that the congregation would have caught on to something there'd be some kind of red flag. Um, I, I mean I don't like the term red flag. There's some cautionary thing going on. Uh, there are people who have um, uh, I, not made it through Doug the first time and have come back a second time and made it through. And so it's not like they're out and they're out forever. We want to care for them and pastor them and give them another chance. And just like Bishop Stevens said, we are for people to make it through. We don't want to hold a threshold up here and say, look, um, if you can't make it, you're out. We're saying we have a passion for you to find your calling and we want you to find it. And we believe that Dove is part of that. And there might be another tributary in your life. Maybe you're not called to be a priest. Maybe you're called to be a vocational deacon. Let us help you discern. Let's discern that together. And so I think what we're, we're trying to say is that there's a togetherness in discernment instead of, you know, silos. We're together in discernment and really want to find out. Thank you, Terry. That's so helpful. I'm sorry, friends, we don't have time for everyone's questions. Um, Bishop Charlie, over to you. Oh, and I'm well done. And uh, I am sorry to those who had questions. And, and maybe you can direct them to Anna uh, by email or phone call. I'm sure she would be glad to hear them, as would Bishop Stephen and the committee. Uh, yeah, great. Bless you. Thank you very much, Bishop Stephen and committee. We're, we're very excited. And uh, we see this as, very, as an important move for the health and long-term long health of ANIC. Now, uh, we're now going to move to uh, uh, council nominations. There are uh, four vacancies, which two laity and two clergy. Uh, and uh, we received uh, the nominations report at council and approved it. And that what I'm bringing to you now is, is what was uh, received and approved. For the laity, can we have those up? There were only two nominated for two vacancies, uh, and there they are. It's uh, Kathy Bailey and Elise Bigley. Uh, I can assure you that uh, there was references taken, all sorts of, uh, of work which was done by the nominations committee, and ultimately, uh, with joy, they presented these two uh, individuals for, for the Annex Council. Uh, and there are no others, uh, so that uh, they are elected by acclamation. Uh, and we thank you. Elise was one of the people assisting in the worship uh, today, and Kathy uh, is well known uh, now at St. Simon's, but originally before at St. Matthew's Abbotsford and part of uh, Solam and uh, a training place. So we're very excited about these two women to be part of our Annex Council. And if we could now have, there are four who are nominated for clergy for two positions. And so we do have to have an election. Uh, you will see them there, Reverend Dr. Ken Deeks, Reverend Sean O'Connor, Reverend Creighton Friedrich, and Reverend Ben Roberts. So this is for two positions for 
the uh, Anna uh, Council to clergy positions. There, the way it works is the the Dawson is the chair. There are five clergy and five laity. So for the clergy, uh, Scott, can you bring up the poll and we're ready to have a vote? Just one moment, please. And we all vote together uh, for for uh, this. We would have all voted for uh, laity and we would have all voted. So, so everyone gets to vote uh, for these two. They're clergy positions, but laity and clergy get to vote. Oh, wow, people are fast. So you can select two names and then... Yes, you only choose two. We're going to give a little bit more time for this vote since there are more options. To close the poll in 10 seconds. We will not be announcing the outcome of this right away. Bishop Charlie, is that right? Or well, it's it's uh, in that it's before us. Uh, I guess we won't be having a break as we had planned. I think so. that's true. So uh, I'm, I'm closing the poll now. And will you just announce, Charlie, the, the two that were elected? That's correct. Uh, so that by my calculations, Reverend Sean O'Connor and the Reverend Dr. Ken Deeks are the two who, uh, who have the two highest uh, percentages and therefore are elected. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I thank all four for allowing their names to stand. And I have, I'm pretty confident that we'll need you in the future. Uh, but for, ne for now, I, I thank uh, Ken Deeks and for Sean O'Connor. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, pray for the four who, uh, who are going to be joining council uh, right away. Uh, oh, God, I thank you for uh, Kathy Bailey and Elise Bigley, for the Reverend Dr. Ken Deeks and the Reverend Sean O'Connor. Uh, we pray your blessing on them and the contribution they will bring to the Annick Council. We thank you for Creighton, the Reverend Creighton and Reverend Ben. Pray your blessing on them in their ministry too, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. We're now going to move to, uh, to uh, our uh, finances. And I alluded to them in my council, if we can get there. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Sue Tolmy. Uh, she'll be going on a video and making a presentation at this time. Is that correct? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. The consolidated financial statements for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021 of ANIC, the Anglican Network in Canada, were audited by Grant Thornton, who had expressed an independent audit opinion based on their review of the books and records. Grant Thornton has reported the financial statements present fairly in all material respects, the financial position of the organization at June 30th, 2021, and the results of its operations and its cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with Canadian accounting standards for not-for-profit organizations. Total revenues for the year were 1.7 million compared to 1.8 million at June 30th, 2020. Expenses were 1.5 million compared to 1.6 million at June 30th, 2020, resulting in a surplus of $223,000 in all funds and specifically $185,000 in general operating. For comparison, at June 30th, 2020, the reported surplus was $216,000. The statement of financial position has increased with net assets of 740,000 compared to 517,000 at June 30th, 2020. How blessed we are with the positive results achieved during the year. Three significant items that contributed to the operating surplus of 185,000 are savings and travel of 40,000, the COVID federal wage subsidy of 71,000, and an increase in donations of 50,000. There has not been much good that has come out of COVID, but for most charities, COVID has had a very positive impact on financial results. 
Good stewardship involves planning for the future, being sure we have an appropriate contingency fund, saving for years that might not be so positive, and determining how we further support the work of Anik. Our God of peace has equipped us with everything good that we may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. We will bring forward two motions. One, that the audited financial report for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021 from the firm Grant Thornton, professional accountant, be received as presented. That will be seconded by Ed Lewis. The second motion, that the firm Grant Thornton, professional accountant, be appointed as the accountant of the Anglican Network in Canada for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2022. That will also be seconded by Ed Lewis. Wow, uh, thank you, Sue. Uh, those numbers just roll off, but they represent an extraordinary work of God uh, for which we give thanks. So uh, is it possible to have the motion, the first motion, uh, Sue Talmy being our treasurer, Ed being our, our chairman of our finance committee. Um, so uh, as Sue has said, uh, moved uh, by her as seconded by Ed Lewis that the financial report for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021 from the firm Grant Thornton Professional Accountant be received as presented. Uh, so we have the motion, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, I wonder if there's any questions, comments, thoughts that anyone wants to, to bring at this time. Yeah, I don't see any hands up. Do you see any hands up, Scott? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Well, that uh, then I think we're ready for the motion. Uh, and uh, I would uh, like to invite um, us. Could you put it up at this point? Okay, so everyone votes together if you're a delegate. So it looks like it's happening already. In favor or opposed? going to give 10 more seconds for you to finish your votes. And I'm going to close the poll now. I will share the results, Bishop. Yes, please. 100% in favor. That is pretty wonderful. Uh, praise the Lord. I, I think it, it's important that we have uh, uh, Bishop Stephen, uh, would you be willing to lead us in prayer as we, as we just stop and thank the Lord for this wonderful provision? Would you lead us in prayer? Are you? Is that possible to, uh, to call on? Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you because you are the God who called us. We thank you for your guidance, and your providence, and your promise of leading the church. And so we see not just the finance, but the development of the church. And we see you are in reign. So we give you thanks. We ask this in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop Stephen. Thank you, uh, Sue and, and Ed and, and Financial Committee. We're grateful to uh, our Anic Council who supervises all this. And, and we're grateful for Grant Thornton, uh, our accountants. So, which brings us to a motion in, uh, with regards to the assignment of auditors for next year. Moved by Sue Talmy, seconded by Ed Lewis, that the firm Grant Thornton Professional Accountant be appointed as the accountant for of the Anakin Network in Canada for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2022. Are we, uh, are we ready for this vote? Uh, is there any questions or comments? If not, could we have the poll placed up, please, Scott? And you know what to do in favor or opposed, everyone gets to vote. It's going to give 10 more seconds for you to finish your votes. And I'm going to 
close the poll now. Now we'll share the results, Bishop. Yes, please. It looks like 100% to me. 100% in favor. Wonderful. So we now have our accountants for auditor for this coming financial year we're into right now. Uh, the next thing, having done with the past, we're now going to deal with the uh, budget for the which we're uh, for the season we're into right now. And Ed Lewis has prepared a video, and uh, I'd ask us to show that now at this time. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Lewis. I am the chair of the Annick Finance Committee and a men member of Annick Council. And I'm here to present the budget for the year 2021-22. As Sue Talmy has just pointed out in the review of the audit, we are currently in a good financial position. This is a result of three factors. One, the faithful and generous tithing of all of our parishes, even during these tough days of COVID. Two, to the reduced expenditures as a result of the limitations imposed by COVID. And three, as a result of the subsidies that we received from the federal government. As was pointed out in the audit, in the 2021 fiscal year, we had a surplus of over $185,000. And this combined with the previous surpluses means that we are in a favorable financial position. This allows us to undertake a number of new initiatives to build the kingdom as are shown in the proposed budget. This is also why we are comfortable proposing this deficit budget. Prior to a brief look at the various items that make up the budget, it is helpful to understand that the ties from our parishes now cover the basic operations of the diocese. And the additional resources that we're seeking through general givings and church planting are all dedicated to expanding our ministries. I should also mention that the Finance Committee recently conducted a strategic planning session where we identified areas where we could more effectively engage donors and processes to identify additional donors and undertake regular updates and encouragement of our donors. Before I go into the details of the budget, I would like you to know that I will be available live to answer questions after this presentation. As you can see from the first line in the spreadsheet, our actual ties for the year 2021 far right column were $968,000, which was more than the budgeted amount, center column, and equal to the ties received in the last full pre-COVID year, 2018-19, which is not shown here. Thus, we have set the budget for ties at $980,000 left column. Donations, second line. These are resources received from individuals and parishes over and above ties. They are budgeted $182,000, left column, just slightly more than the 2021 actual, but less than last year's budget. Church planting, line three. In previous budgets, church planting was a separate budget category in both receipts and expenditures, where we only expanded funds that were actually received for church planting. This left the church plants in a precarious position. We have now made a commitment to three church plants and church planning is part of the general budget and we will spend the budget of expenditures, whether or not we receive the budget amounts. This is in line with our strategic plan to expand our requests for donations outside parish tithes. The $108,000 left co column is more than last year and reflects our commitment to raise additional funds as outlined in our strategic plan. Total anticipated revenue is 1.272 million, slightly less than last year's actuals, partially due to no further government subsidies. Let's now move on to expenditures. Since last year was such a strange year under COVID conditions with substantial reductions in some expenditures, we would be comparing this year's budget, first column, to last year's budget, second column, rather than to last year's actuals. Line one, under expenditures, salaries and benefits national office are slightly less than last year's budget, but include a 2% increase for staff. 
salaries and travel, suffragan bishops, is down slightly. Outreach and contributions up slightly with the addition of a new curacy program and an increase in the tithe to ACNA due to projected increased revenue. Conferences and meetings up slightly. Office expenses, expenses down slightly. Travel up slightly. Church planning up to represent supporting three church plants. Diocesan priorities, professional fees, and bank charges little changed. So the exciting parts are the new initiatives. And these are possible because of our good financial position and our intention to promote these initiatives and secure, secure additional funds to support them. Executive Archdeacon is now for a full year. Ethnic Minority Minister is now full-time versus half-time last year. Ordination Clergy Training Task Force is a new initiative and a grant to Royal College for theological education is also new. Total expenses are 1.335 million, up 154,000 from last year, as a direct result of the new initiatives just above and the curacy program in the outreach and contributions line. We are predicting a deficit of just under $63,000, which we have the capacity to manage. Bishop, I would like to move the acceptance of the budget as distributed and as presented. Bruce Clark, a member of the Finance Committee and a member of ANIC Council, has seconded this motion. Thank you, Ed. Am I, I think I'm unmuted. Uh, well done again. This uh, It amazes me how uh, things which are pretty complex can be brought together before our eyes in, in uh, such that we can understand them. A guy like me can understand them for which I'm grateful. So this is the budget which is presented. Could we have the motion before us and then I'll, I'll call. I see some people would like to ask some questions. Moved by Ed Lewis, seconded by Bruce Clark, that the budget for the fiscal year, July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022 be approved as presented and circulated. So now I see there are some hands uh, and I, I'm gonna ask, so I, I I think uh, Lois Dijon from Montreal would, was the first person I saw. So Lois, would you like to uh, uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself? You need to unmute yourself first. I'm Lois Dijon from, can, you can hear me? Yes. <laughs> from St. Timothy's Anglican Bible Church in Pointe Claire, Quebec. I'm wondering about the salaries and travel for the suffragan bishops. As we know, uh, Bishop Trevor will be retiring at the end of the year and a new suffragan bishop will not, sorry, be appointed until November of next year. And so I'm um, wondering that the amounts are fairly similar uh, between uh, the, this, the proposed budget and the previous budget. It, uh, it is probably, uh, and we'll, we'll look to Ed Lewis. Yeah, why don't I ask Ed Lewis to speak to it? I think I know. Our, our understanding is that uh, there may be a new suffragan before next November. I, I don't know what the process is. But, well, uh, and, and the election of our coadjutor bishop, he will be covering where Bishop Trevor was for the West, as well as phasing into his responsibility to become Doss and so I'm assuming that's where the, the funds will be uh, allocated. Thank you, Bishop. Yeah. Okay, um, now I think I saw uh, Tim, Archdeacon Tim Parent next. So uh, uh, would you like to speak, uh, Arch? I can't see you, but I can see your hand. There we oh. go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bishop. Uh, um, so um, just a question um, in light of uh, the um, emphasis on the Packer College, by the way, as I shared with you, Bishop, I love the name being a J.I. Packer fan and also a Green Bay Packer fan. I think the, the college colors should be gold and green. But uh, apart from that, um, 
my question is, uh, I'm, I'm assuming there wasn't time to allot money for the Packer College because it came up after the budget was set. Um, is the expectation that money raised for that project will be outside of this budget? I think yeah. I can speak to that at this point. That That is correct, that the, the, nothing in the budget is budgeted for Packer College, so it'll be raised separate. As to what we may do as a diocese in the future, that's yet to be established, but this will be entirely separate. Is that correct, uh, Ed? Yes, that's correct, Bishop. Now, I think, uh, I think I saw Ken Deeks next and then Danielle Martel. Uh, also. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Um, my question concerned uh, the college as well. Um, do we know, will it be self-incorporated in what sense will it be legally tied to the diocese? And in what, knowing that no college survives on tuition alone, um, will the diocese become responsible for subsidizing the college and, and meeting shortfalls uh, that are usually quite inevitable with educational institutions? Maybe I can just say uh, that, uh, I mean, maybe John McDonald could sp uh, speak to that as the, uh, does, is he able to speak? Uh, sc yeah, I, I can just comment on that. Uh, I think in terms of the incorporation, uh, it's our plan to begin the work on developing the incorporation papers and the process. And ultimately the goal is to have it as an independent entity. Um, uh, early on, as we're getting started, uh, relative to funding, there is no plans at this point at all to um, have any monies within the ANIC budget relative to this college at this stage. Certainly, it does not. there's none reflected in the current budget. Um, what we're doing is we're really actually working right now on the strategy, the funding strategy going forward. So <clears throat> we're really at a very early stage in both of those processes. But the overall governance process is meant to be ideally independent, and we hope in, in the very near future to have uh, a strategic plan in place that will really help us work towards this budget. There is some work being done now in terms of private um, uh, opportunities that we might have, but at this point, uh, it, 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 there's been no uh, talk at all about expecting ANIC in the normal budget to pick this up. And that doesn't say in some point there might be some contributions, but that's the uh, strategy and the plan at this point. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going, I think actually Danielle before you was Anna Spray and then Danielle. So Anna, would you like to speak? Thanks, Bishop Charlie. Uh, just a quick question about the funding for church plants. Uh, I believe you mentioned, um, Ed, that it was to be, the 108,000 was to be distributed between three church plants. Can you name which, which church plants those are, please? Um, I can't name them by name. There's one uh, in uh, in Quebec. Uh, Bishop, uh, might yeah, be better uh, for you to do uh, this. It's uh, Lazar. It's, it's uh, Jonathan Kamiri is the priest in charge of that one. Uh, there's uh, Daniel Avatan in uh, in the uh, Carlton Play or uh, Canada uh, uh, church plant. And then there's Joe Pinar. Uh, in uh, Highway in North Vancouver. Those are the three. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Bishop. Now, Danielle. Sorry, Reverend Danielle Martel. I'm sorry, I was just trying to unmute. Um, yeah, thank you, Bishop Charlie. Um, I just have a question about the ethnic minority minister. Um, from what I heard there, please correct me if I'm wrong. He's making 36, he or she is making $36,000 a year full-time wage. I'm just curious about that because it's, I don't know how anybody can live on $36,000 a year full-time. Bishop Stephen, would you uh, like to speak to that? Yes, I can answer that question. It's, uh, the diocese only give half and Emmick raise another half. So. Uh, oh. become the full time. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. That's great. Well, friends, uh, we are a little bit beyond the, the, the hour that we were hoping to, to get done. Are we ready for the vote on the budget? Uh, uh, Candice, are you coming back? Uh, okay. 
One more try. Uh, Sorry about that, Bishop. I did have a question about the Ryle College uh, grant. Do we know what that funding is uh, going to be used for? And thank you. John, you have that, I believe. Yeah, there's, there's actually uh, three different categories where the money will be shared. Part of it is to uh, help with the stipend for um, their key uh, professor in terms of their lead person in, in, the, in their program. Um, part of it is dealing with, um, there's a mentoring component to their program. Uh, and it, there's some costs related to the time and the mentoring involved with the uh, students. And, and the third part of it is really dealing with um, incidental costs relative to uh, uh, travel and, and um, regular uh, uh, opportunities for conferences together and so on for these students. So it's spread out uh, uh, in terms of various, uh, these three key component areas. Thanks, John. Thanks, uh, Reverend Dr. And so I'm gonna call for the, for the motion to come up again and uh, or, or the poll where we'll, we all uh, vote. Uh, all right, I'm bringing up the poll now, Bishop. Okay, uh, we can now vote in favor. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll in 10 seconds. So if you can finalize your votes. All right, I'm closing the poll now. So the, the motion is passed 97%, opposed 3%. It's passed and uh, praise the Lord for, uh, for an operating budget that we are now working on uh, for our diocese. Um, I, uh, I think there are a couple of resolutions that came and I, uh, uh, I'm going to say that I, I regret that we will not be debating these. Uh, but I think it would be good to sh put them up uh, and, and uh, we'll refer them to, uh, to the, the Annex Council. All right, I'll put the first up on the screen, Bishop. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see it hasn't been seconded, but I'm sure it would be. Annex 2021 would like to express our thanks for the prayers and kind thoughts of the Annex and Communion Alliance. We thank God for your continued biblical faithfulness and all our, all our shared history over the years. May the Lord continue to strengthen you in the wonderful name of Christ. Uh, we say amen to that, and I know that that would be the, the will of this, uh, of this synod. Uh, and the second motion, please, resolution. Moved by Claire Middleton, seconded by the Reverend Dr. Barbara Richardson, whereas ordained Women, deacons, priests, and rectors have been part of the Anakin Network in Canada from its inception in 2007, and our founding moderator, Bishop Donald, has affirmed them as equally valued gift to the Anakin Network in Canada, and our Bishop Charlie has affirmed during his charge that to the Synod of 20, that we welcome women who are called by God to be ordained. Therefore, I move that the Synod of the Anakin Network in Canada voice their sincere appreciation to all rectors, priests, and deacons who serve in the Anakin Network in Canada, across Canada, and in the U.S. to ensure that they know, one, that men and women, clergy together, are equally welcomed and valued in the network, and two, that the Synod gives thanks for their contributions in the past, present, and future. Uh, that I would say in terms of the appreciation uh, for, uh, I, 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 I just want to say as, as, as Bishop, I recognize that uh, this is a time when uh, uh, women particularly uh, in ministry uh, are at times feel uh, worried and undervalued and, and uh, that is something that we really want to address and uh, I can say for me, uh, it's very important. Uh, that we uh, we be uh, making it clear that we stand for women and men in ministry. And as I have tried to say over the years, all hands on deck, we need all people called uh, to their ministry. Well, um, I am now going to uh, uh, give my assent to all the uh, motions which have been passed. Uh, I also uh, will be uh, 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 
proroguing the synod uh, at this time. And then I'm going to be calling on Bishop Stephen to lead us in worship. And then I'll be uh, doing, give, doing the blessing of dismissal. Friends, this has been an extraordinary and wonderful synod. So many significant things have happened. Uh, and so it's so easy to say I give my assent, but this is a hearty assent for a work of God, which he's done. And we look forward to what he's going to do in the future. So, um, Bishop Stephen, would you lead us in worship? Scott, we need to pass the motions. Of the Did I not? <laughs> my, my assent, to, is that not what you're? Okay, just one second, John McDonald, you've got something that I missed. I just didn't know if you planned on uh, the, the motions for the two resolutions. Are they meant to be, I know you said not debating them, but were you going to take a vote on them? No, no, I was not going to take a vote. I was, okay. I was. Uh, uh, just uh, deferring them to the deferring council. Deferring them to the council. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Bishop Stephen. Yes, um, I think it's the time we come and we sing and we praise our Lord, crown with many crowns. Let's receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with favor and grant you peace. The peace of God be past all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Bishop Stephen, thank you for your blessing 
Uh, dear friends, uh, we have lots that has been accomplished, lots that require us to pray uh, that he would equip us with everything good that we may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, two dates for you to be mindful of is December 11th, uh, a day to honor Bishop Trevor and the launching of, of a wonderful book, History of Anik. Uh, and then February 6th uh, is the uh, consecration of our Bishop-elect, coadjutor Bishop Dan Gifford, and that will be happening at Good Shepherd uh, in uh, Vancouver, February 6th. Um, I, so with all of that, you, we are dis, uh, the, the synod has been prorogued and we are dismissed uh, and God bless you. Thanks very much.